Everyone, how are you doing tonight, Stefan? Doing great. How about yourself? Yeah, I'm doing pretty good. We took a week off uh, just for personal reasons, so we didn't do an episode last week. Uh, but we're back this week, and we should stay on schedule every week, you know, from here on out. Definitely. So, you know, every Wednesday there should be episodes uploaded uh, to, you know, everywhere they, everywhere they go, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and all of your podcast apps. Okay, so this is the Strange Land podcast, and today we are talking about the DC snipers. So, in October 2002, Washington, D.C. was thrown into a state of chaos and panic. Between October 2nd and October 24th, 10 people would be shot and killed in what seemed to be completely random order. They were shot from a good distance away with a high powered rifle and with precision accuracy, showing that whoever was pulling the trigger was highly trained. I say October 2002, but that was only when the coordinated shootings in the D.C. area began. This case actually starts back in February of that same year. It begins with a series of robberies and murders that span many states, including Alabama, Arizona, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, Texas, and ending in Washington with the D.C. shootings. In the end, 17 people would be killed altogether and 10 people would be injured. The people responsible would keep a low profile for the duration of the killings, and until they began leaving notes and demands for the police, the investigators were stumped as to who was doing the shootings. Today, we are going to dive deep into this bizarre and tragic case, which has become known as the DC Snipers and the Beltway Snipers. Yeah, so this is a big one. These guys were were essentially killing people across the country, sniping people from... You know, pretty good distances, always in stealth, and and it was and it seemed so random, and that's because it was very very random. Right. I remember when I was I would have been twelve when this happened. I was born in ninety. I'm twenty seven now. I was I would have been twelve when this happened, and I remember my my mom talking about this and being very scared. And we lived in Texas, yeah. And so we were on the other side of the country, and my mom was still terrified. And I think that you know we'll all see that in this. In this case, it was really terrifying to the general public. The D.C. shootings began in October of 2002. However, between February and September of the same year, 14 additional robberies and attacks would eventually be linked to the same killers who went on the rampage in Washington, D.C. Out of the 14 attacks, seven of the victims would eventually end up dead. Most of the killings were done by a long-range rifle, uh, similar to the killings that were used in D.C. Most were from far away, but a few were close range, and a couple of the shootings were done with a 22 pistol. Most of the shootings were done during a robbery, and they were done with many in, in many different states. So they would go unsolved until they would be eventually linked to the snipers themselves. So most of these killings were from far away, but there were a couple up close and personal altercations where they killed someone, uh, you know, with a 22. We're not going to go over these preliminary shootings in too great of detail just because they were spread out over time in different areas and most seem to be pertaining to these robberies in particular. It almost seems these killings were for practice in a way, to get some killings under their belts before the shooters would go into D.C. However, uh, we will mention every victim and their names and the dates. And I think that's very important, the practice part, because a lot of these were robberies. But I believe that a lot of them were robberies not gone wrong, but killings gone robbery. They killed the people for practice, like you said, and then robbed out of convenience. Because they, they had money on them or they had jewelry or whatever they had on them. Definitely. I think, definitely. That's, I think it's a big part of that. Yeah, you know, once you get a few killings under your belt, it suddenly makes it a lot easier to start you exactly. know, shooting at people indiscriminately. And everyone remember these names and dates he's about to give out aren't the D.C. shootings. They're just the basically the shootings that led up uh, to the D.C. snipings. Right. Yep. 
On February 16th, 21-year-old Kenya Cook, who was killed. The second shooting was on March 19th, a 60-year-old Jerry Taylor, who was killed. The third shooting occurred on August 1st, a 51-year-old named John Guetta, who actually survived the shooting. Our fourth uh, victim um, was shot at on September 5th, 55-year-old Paul LaRuffa, who, sur- who, like I said, survived the shooting. Uh, Our fifth victim was on September 21st, a 41-year-old named Milton A. Wonderman, who was actually killed during this. Uh, The sixth shooting occurred on September 21st, which was actually the same day also as Milton's death. Uh, A 52-year-old named Claudette Parker was killed. Claudette's co-worker also was shot but survived. Our seventh uh, shooting occurred on September 23rd. A 45-year-old named Hong Im Ballinger who was killed. We don't want to make these shootings seem in- insignificant in any way, but in a way they were unrelated specifically to the DC shooting rampage. But we thought, you know, it would be worth to mention. Uh, because, you know, these people were essentially target practice for, for the D- D.C. snipers. Exactly. They were just shootings and killings and robberies. And they led up specifically in, to the D.C. snipers. And, you know, they didn't – no one ever knew. These were unsolved crimes, like you said, until they were linked to the D.C. sniping. Right. So they were – you know, they were shot and robbed and they sort of just walked away and went to a different state. So they were unsolved until they were eventually linked. So the D.C. shootings began on the evening of October 2nd. At 5.20 p.m., a shot was fired through the window of a Michael's Craft store in a suburb of D.C. called Aspen Hill. The bullet actually missed Ann Chapman, a cashier at the store, and no one was injured. Only an hour later, at 6.30, James Martin, who was a 55-year-old program analyst, was shot and killed while in the parking lot of a shopper's food warehouse which was in Wheaton, another suburb of D.C. This would be the first death in the series of D.C. sniper shootings. And this is where everything begins. On the first day, only one person was shot and killed. The next morning, October 3rd, would be one of the deadliest mornings in the history of suburban D.C., and it would be a morning that police would simply not be able to keep up with. It started at 7.41 a.m., when 39-year-old James L. Buchanan was shot and killed while mowing grass at the Fitzgerald Auto Mall. And when, you know, with this one, whenever the 911 call was initially made, Mm -hmm. people thought maybe his mower malfunctioned. And I think on the original 911 call, when, you know, a a passerby or someone who was nearby called, they said, oh, this person's mower just malfunctioned and cut them all up. So, you know, initially they didn't even know that this was a shooting. Another great testimony to how good, you know, eyewitness testimony goes. So, you know, they were in a panic anyway, so I I get that. It's, yeah, sometimes it's hard to know exactly what happened. All they knew was this person was down and bleeding and it was was scary. So it's kind of hard to know, you know, in a panic situation. Definitely. So less than an hour later, at 8.12 a.m., a 54-year-old taxi driver, Prem Kumar Walkar, was killed in Aspen Hill while pumping gas into his taxi at a gas station. Only 25 minutes later, Sarah Romos was killed at the Leisure World Shopping Center in Norbeck. She took a bus to the shopping center and was sitting on a bench reading a book. Only a little over an hour after Sarah's death, 25-year-old Lori Ann Lewis Rivera was killed while cleaning out the inside of her van at a gas station in Kensington, Maryland. This would end the shootings for the morning, but later that evening at 9.20, uh, 72-year-old Pascal Charlotte was shot and killed while he was walking on Georgia Avenue in Washington, D.C. So this is strange, right? It seems to be that these are just normal people, you know, pumping gas. Yeah, these are these are people of different ages, of different sexes, of different ethnicities, these are very random shootings, and on the on the second day, um, you know, five people were shot. So first, the first day one person was shot, the second day five people were shot. Right. 
And so we're talking about a lot. I mean, it was very fast. You know, it was, you know, the taxi driver Prim was killed. And 25 minutes later, Sarah Ramos was killed at a, in a different city. And then just a little over an hour after Sarah's death, another death occurred. And so they're moving fast. So in the span of only 28 hours, six people had been shot and killed at what seemed to be in completely random order. The killers in this instance did not care how old the victim victims were, what race they were, what sex they were, it didn't matter. Anyone was fair game at this point. There wasn't any correlation between any of these victims. The only thing they noticed that whoever was doing these killings would actually travel in the past of least resistance as far as traffic goes to get to the the next area where the next shooting would occur. So the killers would shoot a victim and then plan where they would go next, depending on how easy it would be to get there. For instance, if they shot a victim at 9 a.m. and the traffic was flowing south, they would go north and pick a victim in an area that they wound up. So these guys had particular areas in mind, and the police figured that out. But there didn't seem to be enough of a pattern in the areas to determine exactly where they would go next. In every single one of the shootings, the, victim, the victims were shot with a single bullet that had been fired from a good distance away. Again, they would shoot and disappear. As the news spread, fear spread just as quickly. It took them until the, that night to realize that these shootings were all connected and that someone was going around sniping people in the D.C. area. They knew it would happen again, but they didn't know where it would happen. They decided to keep schools open for the time being, and most parents were very paranoid, understandably. You can only think about what the public was actually thinking when all of this was happening, especially the day of, the day after. I think as a parent, your mind just automatically goes there. Right? Exactly, especially the day after. You know, that night, whenever Pascal was shot, the last victim of day two, you know, right in the middle of Washington, Washington D.C., I believe he was shot right in the middle. Then they knew. It's right. like, you know, you had all these, the, you know, the first four shootings that morning. And then, and then it's, you know, stuff sort of cooled off as the afternoon progressed. So they didn't really know what they were dealing with. And then when that shot came in late that night, I think they knew, you know, they knew right away what was happening. Definitely. And so the next day, as news spread and, and people started to understand exactly what was happening, it was, yeah, it was really, really scary. I can't imagine. Yeah, I mean, and I guess we should mention as well, all the local schools in the area did go into Code Blue, which means basically, you know, like no recess, no mm -hmm. outdoor activities during this time because they just didn't know, which is honestly a, a fair safety precaution. Oh, yeah, definitely. That's like that's that's an easy decision to make. Mm -hmm. It's like you know the kids aren't gonna like it because they don't have recess, but you know what? It's needed. It's needed yeah. to, to protect to protect the children. At so. least they were safe, you know, for the time being. Yeah, definitely. So because of the circumstances behind all of the shootings, the police didn't really have much evidence to go off of. You know, it's only been a couple days, and unbeknownst to the investigators, much more was to come. They had eyewitnesses saying that they saw a white box truck in the area speeding away. So they started pulling over all the white box trucks, but nothing ever came out of it. The first day and a half of the shootings, six people had been killed. The killers decided to spread out the area of assault and began waiting a day or two between the shootings. It seems like they wanted to go big the first you know, day and a half and then send, you know, send everyone into a panic and then go slowly after. And so, so far we've covered October 2nd and October 3rd. And that makes sense if they want to start off with a bang and get people in a panic and get people really worried up and then go slow. It's almost like they're causing tension. It's almost like they go kind of crazy in the beginning and then cause mass tension and like, oh, when's, when's it going to happen? Right. They sort of let the media reflect as well. Like, you know what I mean? They, they, they gave them time to, they're like, wow, all these killings in the past couple days. Mm -hmm. when, when's it going to happen next? What's coming? Exactly. And it keeps happening every day or two, you know, every couple days, which means that it's going to happen. They just don't know exactly when and where. It's not like it's happening all day like it was in the second day. 
So again, we went over the 2nd and the 3rd of October. So the next shooting began on the 4th. Uh, 43-year-old Carolyn Sewell was shot at 2.30 p.m. in the parking lot of a shopping complex. This shopping complex included a Michael's Craft Store, which, if you remember, was where the first bullet was shot through on the first day, which harmed no one. The police noticed this and thought maybe they could figure out a pattern, but that led, of course, to nowhere. It just seemed to be a coincidence, you know. Car Carolyn had been loading bags into her minivan when she was shot. Carolyn would be one of the first survivors of the actual D.C. shootings. As she was lying on the ground in the parking lot, she recalls praying that she would survive and see her children again. At least now we have a survivor, but again, due to the circumstances of the shooting, she was just lucky to be alive. You know, she couldn't really give any information. And this, this makes sense because she's shot from far away. No one sees really anything. They claim to see white box trucks. Uh, we'll find out that that's, you know, another good example of shoddy eyewitness right. reports. And it's essentially a distraction. It's yeah. bad for the Exactly. It definitely the is. And it sucks in this situation because like most most of the time when someone's with serial killers, for instance, when someone's killing people and someone's left to survive, you get something out of them. But it, just like I said, based on the circumstances of these shootings, you can't really get anything. Yeah, these people had nothing to go off of. The cops had nothing to go off of. They didn't know what they were looking for. There was a whole bunch of reports coming in that of different cars that were seen to leave the crime and speeding off. But honestly, if you hear a gunshot, how slow are you going to ride away in your car? You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So it would be three days of silence before on October 7th, the shooters would take things to a whole new level and commit an act that would shock the whole country and send everyone into a deeper sense of panic, as if they weren't already panicked. Yeah. So it was October 7th at 8.09 a.m. Iron Brown was a 13-year-old student who was being taken to school by his aunt. Iron Brown usually takes the bus, but he has been kicked off the bus for eating candy. As Brown was walking up to the path of the school after getting out of his aunt's car, he was shot in the abdomen. This is a 13-year-old child, at a school nonetheless. A shooting at a school. From this moment on, nothing would be the same about this case, and everything escalated. Brown's aunt saw him fall to the ground, she got out of the car, and went to him. She was a nurse, so she knew what to do in this type of situation. She got him in the car and rushed him to the ER. Brown suffered serious injuries, including major damage to vital organs, but thankfully he survived the attack. Yeah, and that's definitely, this is a big turn. I mean, this is a child. And so this is, you know, when we talked about earlier, when they shut the schools down and sent them into code blue or whatever, you know, this is what we were worried about, or this is what they were worried about, really. It's, right. you know, they're worried about their children being shot and it happened. So the, the shooters at this point don't care. They don't care who they shoot. They don't care what age they are. They don't, they don't care. They want to cause damage and they want to cause emotional stress and they want to cause panic. And now they have by shooting a 13 year old. This is a reactionary shooting as well, because that day, October 3rd, when they did kill the, uh, five people there, the police chief, chief came on the news and stated that, you know, listen guys, our children are safe. They're fine. And so the snipers essentially wanted to send a message with this. I mean, the, yeah. the, this w one wasn't so um, random in the fact that... And it still seemed random, though. Right. Yeah. It, it seemed random, but it was also planned out. You know, maybe not the particular person they would shoot in that sense, but they knew what their next target was. Definitely. So on October 9th, two days after Iron Brown's shooting, Dean Harold Myers, who was a 53-year-old civil engineer, was shot and killed while he was pumping gas in his car. This wasn't in Washington, but was across state lines in Prince Williams County, Virginia. A very similar fate would end the life of another 53-year-old man in Virginia just two days later. Kenneth Brides was also at a gas station pumping fuel into his car when he was shot and killed. 
Now, they're starting to see a pattern that these killings are starting to take place at gas stations. Four people had been shot and killed in the recent, you know, days. Gas stations seem to be in just an easy target for people just standing there, you know. It, they were just picking people off, essentially. Gas stations started putting up tarps and hanging them around gas pumps to try and block visibility to protect their customers. Uh, but to no avail, the damage had already been done here. Yeah, and I think that's a good point. It's it's not that they were really trying to hit gas stations necessarily. It's, you know, like we, what we said earlier is they would travel to, you know, they would travel in the direction of least traffic, and wherever they ended up, I don't think they had it really planned. I think wherever they ended up, they would just find a good place to do it and shoot. And that ended up being gas stations a lot. It's because whenever you go pump gas, you get out of your car, you stand there, you pump the gas in, you're just standing there. Most people don't get back in their car. Most people don't do anything else. Most people just stand there like I do every single time right. and let the gas pump in. So it ended up just being easy targets. Just yeah. sort of an anecdote here. Today, I found myself pumping gas at a gas station and just had the thought, like, you know, I just look around yeah, and seriously. have that eerie feeling. Um, Me and Stephanie were walking on break the other day, and there's this, not to go off on a tangent, but there's this huge college right next to where we work, you know? Right. And there's cars everywhere, and I'm just thinking, dude, any of these cars could just pop it us off. It would be so easy. Yeah. That's what's so scary about this case. It's very terrifying that this happened. And we'll go over more of that later, but yeah. it's terrifying. So three days after Kenneth Bridges' death, Linda Franklin, who was a 47-year-old FBI intelligence analyst, was shot and killed in a covered parking lot at a Home Depot in Fairfax County, Virginia. The police received a lead from someone who supposedly had witnessed this shooting. The witness said that he saw a Middle Eastern man shoulder a weapon and shoot from a distance away. The witness then said he got into a cream-colored van which had its left taillight burnt out and sped away. The police were suspicious of this witness as he gave many, many details on the weapon the man had, but not very many details on the van. After much interrogation, the man confessed to making up the story. He was discredited and then arrested for interfering with an investigation. And this is a year after 9-11. And the guy was supposedly Middle Eastern. And so you can just imagine this. I don't know if this guy even saw anything. Actually, no, he didn't because they said that, you know, when they looked at the videotape from the Home Depot surveillance mm -hmm. system, mm -hmm. that guy didn't walk out of Home Depot until three or four minutes after the shooting had happened. So he didn't see anything. He was inside the store when the shooting happened. So he, he just made up this entire thing. And for you know, for what for what for fame for right. who knows why again and, and he, setting the police farther and farther exactly. back. Exactly, and he just said it was mid, he was Middle Eastern. This guy was eventually arrested. I'm sure after interrogation, he fell, admitted to it being fake, and he was arrested. So it would be five days before the next shooting would occur on October 19th. Jeffrey Hopper was shot in a parking lot near a steakhouse that he and his wife had gone to dinner for that night. His wife, Stephanie, called out to people passing by and they were able to get him in an ambulance and to an emergency room fast enough for him to survive. Three days later, bus driver Conrad Johnson was shot early in the morning while he was getting into his bus to start his shift. He was killed. The next day, investigators were able to find evidence that all of the shootings and deaths so far could be linked to the same shooters. So now the police are finally starting to sort of get a grip and realize that the something is happening in the DC area. Yeah, so they they have not they they know what's happening and you know, but there's not much they can do about it and they don't have much. Yeah, they and don't have anything to go off of at this they point. They just know that all the shootings are the same people and honestly, you could sort of just figure that even if you had zero evidence. So Right. So, so like we said, the investigators have not been able to make much of the process in finding out who is doing the shootings themselves. They have no leads, and the way that the shootings are being conducted it just makes it really difficult to actually figure out where the next shooting will take place. The investigation was led by Charles Moose, who was the uh, chief of police at the Montgomery County PD. After the second day and six people had been killed, 
they started to get somewhat of an understanding of how the shooters were working, meaning their mindset, what places they were actually picking to make these killings, you know, just they're trying to draw any lines they can. But it's still really hard to figure out when and where they would attack next. They were able to figure out that the shooters would shoot and then quickly vanish from the scene. Which would mean that the shooters were most likely in a vehicle. They also determined that the shooters would vanish and head whichever direction there was the least amount of traffic. The investigators were able to get a task force open on the case and were able to be ready at any time within minutes of any shooting that occurred. They would then circle out through the area and block off all the roads leading away from the scene. They would get witnesses and get surveillance tapes from nearby stores. They would inspect all of the drivers in the area and highways which would actually make traffic come to a halt for hours at a time. Investigators had many eyewitness accounts coming in, and so many in fact that they ended up becoming confusing and not reliable. After a few witnesses saw the white box truck leaving the scene at the shooting of Sarah Ramos, many reports of vans started flooding into the investigation, and the police subsequently started pulling over white trucks and vans, but nothing ever came from that. The investigators put out phone line taps and a reward of $500,000 for any tips leading to the arrest of the shooters. Over 60,000 calls flooded the tip line, which made everything more confusing. There were quite a few people that called in to the tip line pretending to be the shooters, but at one point, the shooters actually did call the tip line. The shooters called 911 and explained that he was the shooter and told the dispatcher to not say anything. He said that they had tried to get into contact with police multiple times but were unsuccessful, and this is why people had died. The dispatcher told the shooter that the call line had been set up to receive tips, and then the shooter hung up. We assume the shooter had already tried to call the hotline because he had said that he had attempted to get into contact but was unsuccessful. Yeah, and this is, you know, this is kind of weird. If you listen to the call that the shooter gave, it's kind of strange because the call the shooter calls in and says, listen, don't speak. I'm the guy who's responsible for the D.C. shootings. And then, you know, he, he tries to say something and the lady's just like, well, you know what? We can't do anything. Call the hotline. I don't and know then if, hangs up and then on him. Well, I don't know if she hung up or the guy or the or shooter if he came actually hung up. But hung up. If the sh- it still seems kind of strange. I feel like if you're a dispatcher, or you know, you you should do something more about that. Right. But maybe they were getting more calls than you know just that. One. Maybe because we do find out that the shooters did call, but multiple people also called in and, and pretended to be the shooters. So right. they may have been receiving calls and just saying, if anyone calls in, you know, to say that they're the shooters, just give them the hotline number, which right. is what she did. So yeah, I don't know. It's not that big of a deal, but it seems like they could have done a little bit more whenever the actual shooters called in. But again, it may have been harder than, you know, just that. So, so I just want to get to a point where we realize that now the the killers are almost in a sense making themselves known they're starting to talk to police this is different this is more information that we had before even though that the cops aren't aware of what's happening the killers are starting to make a change in a sense and that they want to be known you know exactly. they so have they, things to say yeah so they called up and they wanted to speak to someone, and they couldn't get through. And who knows how many times they tried this? Uh, but they were definitely at this point trying to trying to talk to the pol- to the police. Right. So, so at several of the crime scenes, you know, left by the shooters, tarot cards were left with cryptic messages on them. At the shooting of 13 year old Iron Brown, the police discovered a card with three lines written on the back. The lines were, "For you, Mr. Police," and "Call me God." And do not release to the press. 
Okay, so can we talk about this for a second? How crazy that is? Yeah. Uh, it really, they're like, it's boastful at this point. You're leaving, I mean. For, for you, Mr. Police, and call me God, it's. And not only that, it was the death terror card. Like, to me, that just comes off as dramatic. Like, these guys, like, are now loving the sort of oh yeah uh, and reaction they're getting and they're they're sniping people and just walking away or driving away and and now they're saying call me god i think that's a big one because you know they're they're either trolling the police or they actually believe themselves to be as powerful as god and that kind of makes sense because they are playing god they're killing people and no one knows who it is it's right. the same thing. So they're definitely playing God. And they're getting away every single time. Exactly. But the problem is, and we'll discuss this more later, but just off the record, you know, when you start speaking to the police or, you know, like how they're doing just out in the open, right? It's it leads to bad things. It's... It's a, it's a really easy way to get yourself caught. Yeah, and, and leaving... Uh, I'm sorry, I just have to reiterate. Leaving a tarot card at the scene. Call me God. The yeah. death card at that. It's just very... It, it shows, like, some sort of ego behind these killings. It shows oh, yeah. intent. It, 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 it says a lot more about motive than it really should. It's a, a huge. Way. It's a huge part of ego. I mean, that's all it is. When you say, call me God, that's all ego. Yeah. Yeah. It's just the style. It's just like it's what you would read in a serial killer novel that was written, you know, like something completely nonfiction or or I'm sorry, fiction, but it's it's just crazy to me. Yeah. It's so dramatic. Well, so they also found a shell casing in the grassy area that they discovered had been used to hide in while shooting Iron Brown. This led to a more understanding point of what gun was used. On October 19th, at the shooting of Jeffrey Hopper, the investigators found a four-page letters letter from the shooters demanding $10 million and threatening more children's lives if they didn't get what they want. On the shooting of Conrad Johnson, which again was the last, the investigators found another letter that included the line, Your children are not safe anywhere at any time. So at this point, the shooters began really talking with the investigators and the police and letting them know that they do want to have a conversation. The investigators had been, you know, again, we've said this, but they're having a hard time with this case, and they didn't have very many leads for most of it. It took them a good amount of time to put everything together, and by the time they did, many people had been shot and killed. The shooters began communicating with the police at this point, and this would eventually be their downfall. So finally, a lead came in from over 2,000 miles away, and it broke the case wide open. A man named Robert Holmes called in because he believed his friend was the D.C. sniper. The day after the ninth victim was killed in the Home Depot parking lot, Robert Holmes called in and spoke to his local FBI office. He waited for a couple days and eventually received a call from an FBI agent who was working on the case. Holmes gave the agent information on a close friend of his named John Muhammad. He explained that he and Muhammad were in the army together, that Muhammad was a master marksman and had discussed equipping a long-distance rifle with a silencer. He then told the agent that about a year ago, or about a year before the shootings began actually, Muhammad had lost custody of his three children to his ex-wife, and his wife had moved out to Washington, D.C., John Holmes just had his had this gut feeling that his that it was his friend, John Muhammad, who was doing the shootings. Now all they had to do was process this information and see if it fits anywhere in the investigation. What a hell of a gut feeling to have, you know, having yeah. no evidence but going, oh. I mean, there I and there is, is there's a lot of circumstantial evidence, but I think that it's one of those things where they very easily could have it could have just been someone else, right? Hey, you know, this friend John Muhammad just could have been anywhere. Definitely, it, but but his his buddy had whatever we want to call it an intuition, we'll say. Yeah, that. and there was circumstantial evidence, so and it I mean it couldn't have been more spot on exactly just interesting definitely 
So October 17th, someone claiming to be the shooter called the tip line again. This time, he accidentally gave clues that led them to an unsolved case that was Claudette Parker, the 52-year-old liquor store clerk who had been shot at in Montgomery, Alabama. The investigators ran the fingerprints from the liquor store scene and they matched up with the fingerprint that came back from the immigration and naturalization service. Basically, anytime someone immigrates to the states, they give their fingerprints and it's on record. The fingerprint belonged to the 17-year-old man named Lee Boyd Malvo. They then were able to get the prints from the middle school where Iron Brown was shot, and they matched to the fingerprints from the liquor store shooting. So, now that they have a name, Lee Boyd Malvo, they also have a picture of him, which also was taken during immigration. They know that this man committed the liquor store killing, and they now know that he's the DC sniper. Once they started doing some more research on Malvo, they quickly discover that the close ties he has is to a man named John Allen Muhammad. John Muhammad, like we mentioned earlier, the name of the friend of John Holmes, the man who had given the tip to the investigators. John Holmes went in and had a three-hour interview with the FBI. The FBI showed Holmes a tape of the phone call they believed had come from the shooters and asked if uh, it was actually Muhammad on the tape. He said no, but it could be Muhammad's surrogate son, Malvo. Holmes said that Muhammad and Malvo traveled together and Malvo looked up to Muhammad as a father figure. He said that the last time the two had come over to his house, they showed Holmes an assault rifle with a scope and a book on how to make a suppressor. He also showed them a tree trunk in the backyard where Muhammad had shot rounds into with the assault gun. They cut out a segment from the trunk and shipped it to its crime lab, where it came back with a positive match from the bullet at the scene of the Iron Brown shooting. You mentioned a book on how to make a suppressor. Yeah. I think I have that book. No, but how much more of that it is, the, uh, <laughs> the, the anarchist, anarchist cookbook, cookbook yeah. which I have. I bet. I bet that was the book. I mean, and I mean, how many people have? I mean, a lot of people probably. Not to say I'm a terrorist. It. I just have that book. Right. So there is a motive here. You know, his ex-wife has custody of their kids and moved to the Washington, D.C. area. These are things that Holmes used as, you know, evidence to say that it was his friend. They learned that Muhammad's ex-wife obtained a protective order against him. The police discovered that the New Jersey license plates that were issued to Muhammad were for a blue 1990 Chevy Caprice. Now they have a car. They also discovered that the car has been spotted by radio patrol cars at the scene of several shooting locations, but the car was never stopped and searched. The police started to get the word out that they were looking for a dark blue Chevy Caprice. They gave this information to the public and made it known that they were no longer looking for a white box van. On October 24th, 2002, a 1990 blue Chevy Caprice was seen at a rest stop off of Interstate 70. Whitney Donahue had parked at the rest stop as well to relax on a drive when he noticed the car and remembered the announcement that he'd heard on the radio about the car. He called the police right away and State Trooper D. Wayne Smith of the Maryland State Police first arrived at the scene and blocked the exit to the rest area. More troopers arrived at the scene and blocked the entrance and the exits even further, with the occupants of the Blue Caprice sleeping inside the car, unaware of the ever-growing police force surrounding them. The troopers also used an 18-wheeler to, you know, who was basically trying to exit the area. They used it to block the exit even further, and it basically fully blocked the rest area's exit. SWAT teams surrounded the car and found Malvo and Muhammad asleep inside. They found a stolen Bushmaster 20, 223 caliber uh, weapon and a bipod inside the car. They were both arrested, and ballistics also eventually uh, conclusively linked the weapon to 11 out of the 14 shootings. So now... 
we have they have the guys. Yeah. You know, after all of this time, after all of these shootings, after everything that's happened, they finally catch them, and everyone's just, you know, relieved. Everyone's completely relieved that they finally have the people. And they went pretty much without a fight. They were caught sort of with their pants around their ankles. And Literally, it was a they were sleeping. Easy in the arrest. Corner. Yeah. Yeah, and and you know they had the whole SWAT team come up, and you know arrest them. And they had everything blocked off. So they did, yeah, they definitely did everything, you know, to the book. And they came in and just got them out. And then there's nothing that they could do at this point. Yeah, they were they were caught. And finally, Washington, D.C. Washing, I've been to Washington, D.C., by the way. Um, not the best place to live. Sorry, Washington. Um, but... It was it was interesting when I went there. Yeah, and Lee, so Lee Boyd Malvo was 17 at the time, and John Allen Muhammad uh, was 41. And so like we said before, you know, John Allen Muhammad uh, had met Lee Boyd Malvo, and they became friends, and really Lee Boyd Malvo kind of looked up to John Muhammad as a father figure. And, you know, we know that John Muhammad, would, had, he had been in the, he had served in the Army, and he was very proficient at... Uh, sh- at shooting, he's he was very pr- pr- uh, proficient with weapons, uh, just in general. And so th- he kind of used this knowledge and this experience to teach Lee Boyd Malvo how to shoot and how to kill. Uh, which again was which is why those pr- uh, those early shootings uh, before the DC snipers um, happen. It's like you know he kind of taught him what to do and how to do it and how to kill. Right. To sort of get ready for the DC uh, snipers, snipings. So during their trials in the fall of 2003, including the two victims in Virginia, Muhammad and Malvo were each found guilty of murder and weapons charges. The jury in Muhammad's case recommended that he be sentenced to death, while Malvo's jury recommended a sentence of life in prison without parole instead of the death penalty. And this is really because Malvo is only 17 years old, so they're, they're not going to really try to sentence him to death. And of course, they're both found guilty. You know, they're both they're both obviously guilty. Right. They got caught red-handed. Exactly. And all the evidence pointing towards the fact that they did it is overwhelming. So they were found guilty, and John Muhammad was sentenced to death, and Malvo was sentenced, like you said, to life in prison without parole. Right. And he's still in prison to this day. You know, he was 17 at the time, which what would that what would that make him 30? Right? Yeah, now? he's in his 30s. I think he's in his mid 30s now. Yeah, exactly. So, and of course, like I said, John Muhammad was sentenced to death, and he was put to death in 2011. Am I right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, yeah. And you know, it's really weird. I think, in fact, I know Malvo eventually what he sent a letter, like an apology letter, to Iron Brown. Remember the 13-year-old boy who was shot and survived? Right. Eventually, in prison, from prison, Malvo sent an apology letter to Iron Brown. So who knows if... You know, it's it's really interesting to think about, to think about sort of how this happened, why this happened, and, and how, you know, this is a 17-year-old boy from Jamaica who right. came to America, you know, to try to make a life for himself. And, you know, he ended up meeting John Muhammad and... It's it's sort of interesting to think about how this even happened. If Malvo had never met John Muhammad, what would have even happened? Right. And I read that, you know, in their confessions, Malvo sort of went against Muhammad and but he but he also confessed to pulling the trigger in every single in every single killing. Definitely. So it wasn't Muhammad who had been who was trained in uh, guns and trained in shooting and, and militarily trained for all of this. He just taught Malvo you know, how to execute people. And Malvo did it. And he did it with precision. But I think the biggest thing here, like in our last episode, we talked about Catherine Knight and how she would sort of manipulate people around around her, you know, Mm. to, to her liking. And I think that's what happened in this case as well. Like we all know when you're 17 years old, you're, you're more likely to believe some bullshit that you hear from somebody. You know exactly. what I mean? If if you look up to somebody, you're more willing to accept any sort of claim they make. And I think that's what happened here. 
Listen, when I heard his interviews uh, and how he sort of carries himself now, it, it leads me to believe that he realizes what he did was bad. I don't think at the time, I think at the time of the killings, he was so angsty. What he thought he was doing was probably okay in some fashion. And how is that? You know, how? Right. I mean, was he completely brainwashed by John Muhammad? Is that the case? I don't, you know. Yeah, I don't know. It's hard to say if he was completely brainwashed. I mean, he obviously knew what was what was happening to him, but he also knew that he had a father figure he could look up to and someone he was making proud. So there's a weird psychological dynamic that's that's happening and it's it, it's not just as black and white to me as if, yeah, you know, like he and was he, just doing what he was told. There was a lot of things happening. Yeah, and he probably looked at him more, more than just a father figure, more as this god almost. I want to say, yeah, I, I was gonna say that too, like a religious figure almost. That may be looking too much into Maybe, it, but, but yeah. I mean, I think it's fair to say if you're going to go on a killing spree and you're, a person has convinced you to do this, essentially, that you hold them fairly highly, you exactly. know? And so this this one was really interesting. I mean, it was one I wanted to do for a long time, and it really reminds me of just... I don't want to say this on the podcast. I say this off, off air, but it's like Grand Theft Auto. It's just so insane. You kind it of is. just go around and start sniping people, but in real life, and I think that's that's why it's so terrifying. Someone did this insane thing that you never really think about that anyone could do, and anyone could do it at this time as well. They could right. just start doing it again. It's very terrifying. And, it and, is. and how at, at, at the randomness of of how it was done. And on that note, the motive. So we talked about John Muhammad's ex-wife. Mm-hmm. Well, so the motive that, you know, that I have I've read about is that basically they were choosing very random people on purpose. They were choosing the most random looking people, different ages, different sexes, dif- different uh, ethnic- ethnicities right. on purpose because eventually John Muhammad wanted to kill his ex-wife and then it would just look random. Totally. And so that's that's the thing that I've read. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how true that is, but it's it seems like you know they moved across the country to Washington D.C. and then they started the shootings, and so it, that seems like a you know it seems like that's it's plausible. Yeah, it's not hard to believe at all. Honestly, I I think that's you know that's a fair that's a fair guess as to what's happening, and I think a lot of people have sort of corroborated that. Even his wife admits that he was going to kill her. You know, exactly. Exactly, and then, and she had a restraining order against him. Mm-hmm. So remember that. So we, so she knows that he's dangerous. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So that was the DC snipers again. They're you know also called the Beltway snipers, and you know this was something that I remember growing up. This is something that my mom would had told me about probably after it happened, but I remember seeing it on the news. And I lived in Texas, so it was a very big thing. I wasn't even in the area. Can you imagine just being terrified, running around? You know, not knowing if you're going to get shot. I watched an interview where, you know, someone had interviewed someone on the street and he was just jumping around and running. And he was like, even just standing here talking to you right now, I feel very frightened. I feel very nervous that I'm about to be killed because that's what was happening. So it's right. very insane. Yeah, it is crazy. And they, they, I, I'm glad they, to me, they got what they deserved, these people. They, struck fear within the community but they also were pretty effective at at what they did that's why this is so like devastating you know it it was senseless like all the killings were senseless yeah and it's another thing like if they hadn't started talking to the cops where would they be because before they started communicating with the cops they had almost no evidence Mm -hmm. i mean they may have found because they did find the fingerprint at iron brown's shooting and they they were able to connect that with the with um, with Malvo, I believe without any any interaction with the shooters at all, but still, it's like who knows where how far they could have gone before they left enough evidence to get themselves caught without yeah. communicating. So, and it, I, for some reason, there is a part of me that says this could have gotten a lot worse if they didn't get caught. You know, exactly. Oh, for sure, they could have went a lot longer. 
Definitely. So who are we talking about next week? So next week, guys, is Todd Kendhammer. It's a pretty interesting case. Um, yeah, very interesting. It's it, very... It's out of a bad horror movie, really. It yeah, is. Yeah, it, it really is. It's. It, it reminds me of a bad Final Destination. Yeah. yeah it's... It's it's very strange, but not, I I assume not a lot of people have heard of this. And this is and Todd the Todd Ken, Kent Hammer case that we're talking about next week just happened. It happened in 2016. Mm-hmm. In fact, last month he was sentenced. Right. So it this is almost ongoing. This just happened. Fairly new. I think you guys will enjoy that one a lot. It's pretty bizarre to say the least. Yes. Yeah, so look out for that next week. And again, this is the Strange Land podcast. We're your hosts, Kenny and And Stefan. Stefan. And so we will see you next week. Later. Later.